Good afternoon. It is March the 24th, 2021, about four o'clock in the afternoon. Now, I'm Dryden Pants. I'm going to cover a few things in this video today. Most notably, I'm going to talk about the markets, the virus, policy, uh, what's going on in the economy, and then kind of what does all this stuff mean? I'll run through it fairly quickly, so I hope you find it interesting. When we think about the markets, what's interesting is you think about where we are right now. We're pretty much in exactly a year from one of the biggest, most rapid dips we've had in the market in history. So we've had one of the most quick round trips of a market collapsing and then rising back up, about 126 trading days. So this is the fastest round trip we've had in history. And it's really kind of affecting things. The good news is we've recovered dramatically. The interesting news is that it's gonna make comparisons and headlines and all those things for the next couple of months really kind of interesting. Things are gonna be overstated and understated and over-concerned and under-concerned. So be prepared for very weird headlines. Now, when we think about it, if you look at index performance, we try, everybody tries to look, well, what's the trailing 12 months? Well, trailing 12 months from a massively abnormal uh, result on the fastest declines of the market in history, then you can look at the Russell, it's up you know, 121%, NASDAQ's up 94, the S&P 500 is up 76. Those are huge numbers. They're outsized numbers. They're abnormal numbers. And the point of the matter is, is we have to begin to make sure as we think about the rest of this year that we begin to put things in appropriate perspective. So we had this massive recovery last year, but as we look at things that happened year to date, you look at each of the sectors, some sectors are doing well, some sectors are more muted. If you look at full year numbers, they're, they're, they're very outsized and very large. And you also, you can kind of look at them relative to pre-pandemic. So what I mean by this is if you go back and look at right before pan the pandemic, right, to right now, well, information technology and some of the technology stuff are up 29, 28, 29%. That's pretty phenomenal. But you see other segments of the market, not quite so much. And then if you look year to date, you recognize what we really saw at the end of last year was a rapid rise in the market. And then things have kind of leveled off. Now, the other thing that's happened, if you think about with growth and value, there's always a big debate there. And for a while, growth, as we looked at the recovery, got way out ahead of value stocks. And when that happens, basically, uh, eventually things adjust. So you saw value come up in the market and you saw growth kind of, this is this volatility that we've seen lately. So you had this market adjustment. Now remember, the market adjusts frequently. It's a 10% correction in the NASDAQ is not something uh, that is unusual, right? So we had that correction and now we're kind of building off of that. So when you've gone through there, this was, this was through about March the 8th. Uh, and then now since that time, if you look out to the tail of the graph here, you can see how the markets, uh, the, both growth and value are kind of moving a little bit more uh, in, in synchronization here. So this big adjustment has kind of occurred. Uh, we've had a small correction in the, in the tech stocks, and now we're kind of going to be moving sideways for a while as things sort themselves out. So it's a consolidation moment, uh, you might say. Uh, and then now the question is, what's happening in the future? What does the rest of the year look like? Well, let's take a look at the big thing now is still the virus. You know, the virus for the last 12 months, the virus has been the most dominant thing moving the global economy, right? It was the virus caused governments to shut things down. And as governments shut things down, you had the massive decline uh, in, in the economic activity and kind of markets followed and then we've seen this recovery. But here's the good news. If you look at the US, you can see quite clearly, we've had several waves of the virus but we're now clearly becoming on the other side of it. You know, we have two things going on. You have a lot of people got sick. A lot of people got COVID-19 and so now they've recovered and they have antibodies. And then now we're beginning to see a lot of people get vaccinated. So the group of people that either have antibodies because they've been vaccinated or they have antibodies because they've had it and recovered is becoming fairly large. And that bodes well for our economy as we open up. And you can take a look at hospitalizations, the rates as well. These are waves that work their way through. Now, how is the United States versus the European Union? This is significant. Our experience is a little bit better at this point. 
What does this mean for us going forward? It means that as the United States recovers, the rest of the world and our trading partners are recovering, but it's no longer synchronized. So the virus is affecting different populations differently. That's going to affect economic recoveries differently. Some company, countries are going to move faster than others. So this creates a, a unsynchronized global growth pattern. There's two things to remember about that. First of all, that makes things choppy. But secondly, it also gives us opportunities because we can kind of see how economies recover, kind of like the U.S. economy is recovering. And then we can kind of look back and say, well, who, who still has a ways to go? What other economies haven't recovered quite as quickly? And so we can recognize that there's probably opportunities there if they're going to follow the same pattern. We can kind of see how these playbooks repeat. So you can look at the other foreign countries and what's going on. And the path to immunity around the world, you can kind of see where we are in the U.S. Uh, versus Europe. We're a bit ahead of them in the number of people we're vaccinating and how we're growing. So if we're going to be probably at, in the next five months at this rate, we're going to have about 75% of the population vaccinated. And that's going to really kind of make sure that everything can open up even more so than it already is. And then when you, if you think of that, you look at Europe, they're about 18 months away. So this tells us, first of all, if you're planning to travel to Europe this summer, yeah, you might want to be looking somewhere else. That's the first thing. The second thing is, if we're looking at the pattern of recovery and investment opportunities, as you've seen the market in the U.S. and the economy in the U.S. begin to move uh, very quickly back to some, some pre-pandemic level, you can look at those patterns in other countries around the world. So we kind of explore uh, outside the U.S. now for opportunities as we move through this. So you can, again, see how this is going on around the world, paying attention to you know, the countries that are maybe doing this and recovering better and faster on a global basis. So here's the big so what, right? So by the time we get to the third or the fourth quarter, enough people in the United States will have had the vaccine or the disease so that we probably got herd immunity and people things can begin to uh, go back to a different version of normal. We'll probably have some things that never go back to the way they were. But we're going to have a lot of things going on as people try to get back to some sense of, of community, get back to some sense of, of going on vacations and doing all the things. There's a huge amount of pent up demand uh, that people have, have had over this last year. So we have to pay close attention to that. And we can see that in the latter part of the year, we're going to see those phenomenons work their way through the economy. And that does matter for the stock market. So it's still an issue of stimulus versus virus, but there's two big things going on. One, we have more stimulus and now we have less virus. So as you look at what's going on in the United States, we've added, if you add up all the stimulus bills, most of about four, $5.4 trillion dollars worth of stimulus has already been put into the system or is working its way into the system now. That's quite significant. I want to kind of give you an idea of just how much $5.4 trillion is. If you think of it and we adjust for, for currencies and inflation and stuff, $5.4 trillion is about the same amount of money as we spent on World War II. I'll say that again. We've spent about as much money in, in the last year on coronavirus response as we spent on all of World War II. And it's, it's a lot. Now, when you think about it as a percentage of GDP, you know, that's a little less. So we spend about 25% uh, of nominal GDP uh, in stimulus that we've added as a response to the virus. And then in World War II, we spent about 50% of uh, our, our GDP, about 45%, 50% of GDP uh, in response to the war. So while in response to World War II, if you're thinking about it that way, we've spent about the same amount of money, but since our economy has grown, it's about half as much uh, in relative terms. Either way, it's a tremendous amount of stimulus has been pushed into this economy. And as it's being pushed into this economy, and as, as state and local governments have recovered faster uh, in many states than they expected to, we're beginning to see what's going to translate 
All of this stimulus is going to translate into a significant increase in GDP growth. Of course, it's just kind of a, from, a, from a low relative last year. But we can see GDP growing uh, this year and next year. We can see unemployment coming down. And we can see also con uh, consumer and personal consumption expenditures going up. All of these bode well uh, for the underlying economy. Again, fueled by government spending. There is a long-term debt bill to pay here. But for right now, you're looking at a tremendous amount of stimulus in the economy. And then they're adding to that a desire to do a large infrastructure spend, which could be as much as another $3 trillion. So these are all very stimulative in various, in various ways. Now, what does this mean as we look at the entire year? Well, we really kind of look at this year as a, a tale of two halves, rather than trying to think quarter to quarter, and I've mentioned this before, is that the first half of the year, the economy is going to be driven by this massive government stimulus. And the second half of the year, the economy is going to be driven by pent-up demand uh, from consumers funded by savings. Because you see what's happened during the pandemic is that while you had a tremendously large number of people very, very negatively affected and, and, and they needed a tremendous amount of help and you had these, these issues and parts of the economy that were highly affected, you also had other parts of the economy that weren't quite as much. And so people weren't spending as much. They've saved a lot. They've been able to bank their stimulus. And you see, see you know, stimulus checks have kind of been part of what's driven some of these outside volatility uh, in the market in and of itself. So what you see is the first half of the year is going to be government-driven stimulus. The second half of the year, people are, have, have very high pent-up demand. They're going to start spending some of their savings and getting back out and doing the things that they've been putting off for a while. And you can see how we've recovered dramatically uh, on the unemployment front. Uh, we still have a little ways to go to get back to where we were, say, four years ago, but you can see this dramatic recovery. The recovery is going to be a little bit slower now because it's all broken down by sectors. And you can see some sectors uh, in terms of the, the number of people that are unemployed. We still have you know, leisure and hospitality still uh, you know, they've got about negative 3.45 million people uh, having employment there. So they've still lost a tremendous amount of jobs. But we see that improving again as you, you begin to overcome the virus issue, leisure and hospitality, pent up demand, all those things kind of roll to the back half of the year so we can think about some significant improvement in those circumstances. Now, I want to talk about some of the key things that are happening that are affecting the, the markets, that are affecting interest rates, that are affecting a lot of headlines. Here's the thing that's very important. Don't forget about supply chains. Now we actually, this is, they, these are ships sitting in Long Beach, LA Harbor, waiting to unload. This is, more ships are backed up, waiting to unload than at any time in history. I mean, it's, 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 it's a, biggest number that I've ever seen, uh, and I've been watching this for a long, long time. And what this is, is a really a phenomenon of two or three things. Slower actions at the port due to COVID, but also the massive increase in online e-commerce has generated a lot of demand uh, for things being shipped in and a lot of things people have bought. And so you see all these container ships trying to come in and unload and the supply chains are constrained both by COVID, by things coming in over a period of time. And so what normal what normally was a, a regularly functioning supply chain has now become clogged up. Now, I want to talk about what this does. Well, this is kind of you know hieroglyphics here, but when you see a supply chain uh, constriction, so when supply chains become constrained, right, and they can't get everything to where they need to be, what happens? Well, that translates into higher prices. You've probably seen this. There aren't as many sales going on at stores, right? If you order something, it's on back order. Well, when, when a store is selling all that it can get of something, do they put it on sale? No, they don't. So there's fewer sales, and we're beginning to see higher prices, and that's driven by the fact that just the supply chain is somewhat constrained getting here. Well. Now, when they run all of this through their equations and people look at it, and how do we feel about it as consumers? 
So supply, constrained supply chains turn into higher prices. Fewer sales mean higher prices, right? Or there's more back orders and things like that. Well, that translates into inflation. So the numbers that people look at, they say, well, inflation is going up and it's ticking up a little bit on inflation. And then people panic because they see inflation and they say, oh my gosh, we have to, now interest rates have got to go up. So this is this kind of relation uh, ship that occurs and that has created some volatility. So remember, supply chain constraints transfer to higher prices, transfers to inflation, transfers to higher long-term expected interest rates. Now, so that has created some bond market volatility of late, right? So you see the bond market interest rates going up, bond market volatility is there, and that's created some stock market reactions. So if you pay attention to the media, you see this going on. But here's the thing to recognize. Once the supply chains become normalized and kind of catch back up from all of this stuff, again, remember, it's a, part of it's COVID, part of it's virus, part of it's just online sale, part of it's all the stimulus, right? But when the supply chains kind of become normalized and are running back as efficiently as they were before, well, that's the, that's the thing that's driving all these increases. Things will begin to normalize and things will then move back. So this tick up in interest rate, we begin to see it as temporal and it's going to kind of begin to level back off. So what does all of this mean? Well, in summary, you got market volatility for the next several months. It's driven by a number of things. Part of it is this interest rate bond market thing. Part of it is you have a lot of people getting stimulus checks and, and their savings rates have gone up and, and, they, and, and they don't need the money necessarily. They're throwing it into the stock market kind of willy nilly. So you're beginning to see all these things create some volatility. And remember, you know, volatility is one of those things, you know, you, you want to basically take advantage of it and not be its victim. So we want to make sure that we're, we're paying close attention. And as the markets kind of move around, we, we buy the things that are on sale. That's important. And the other thing you have to pay attention to is that if we look through tax policy for the rest of the year and you see some things that we've made good money on, right, maybe it's time to take some capital gains and redeploy that capital. That's one thing to pay attention to. How are you going to manage the long-term capital gains part of this? Remember, if someone bought at the bottom, right, They've just now reached the period of time where they could take long-term capital gains. So that's again going to add some volatility to the markets. Now, but the good news in all of this is that company earnings are coming back dramatically. We're going to go into earnings season here pretty quick. And higher earnings incre increase what I call price quality. And what I mean by that is when price to earnings ratios get a little high and everybody talks, well, the market's toppy and things like that. As earnings come up, the price may not move quite as much, but the quality of that valuation goes up because earnings are now moving up to support the price that's there. And that's why, you know, in the end, no matter what, fundamentals win. So we've got to pay close attention to the earnings of these companies and fundamental consumer demand. Now, number three, stimulus is beating the virus, right? We've got plenty of government spending to come in and, and bridge the gap and take care of the economy and move it forward, right? And then in the meantime, the medical professionals have put us in a situation where we've got people with vaccinations, we're caring for people in hospitals better. And so overall, stimulus is beating virus. So the first half of the year, as I said, government stimulus, the second half of the year, it's consumer stimulus. And then we go to inflation and interest rates are going to increase to this amplified demand, right? Demand's going up in supply chain constraints. The Fed wants inflation. And they've been, to, they've been trying ever since, ever since the crisis back in 2009. The Fed has been trying to say, we want to get 2% or better inflation. We need 2% inflation. Well, they, they, they're, they're really trying very hard to get there and they haven't. So what they kind of said is, not only do we want 2% inflation, we're okay with it getting a little hotter than that, right? And so the Fed wants some inflation, and so they're going to keep liquidity abundant. So there's going to be plenty of money in the economy. Interest rates are going to stay relatively low to what they were, and then we're going to begin to see uh, plenty of uh, liquidity in this economy to, to help fund things. They do want inflation. So the economy is growing, unemployment's falling, 
U.S. market prices are going to be volatile, but price quality is going to be including, improving. So what we need to do is if we have cash on hand, we need to be uh, thoughtful about how we put it to work. But there's going to be opportunities, we expect, not only in the U.S., but also globally as we see this variable speed recovery that I've talked about. The U.S. is growing at one speed, other countries are at various other speeds, and we can begin to kind of look at the basic human condition that's driving fundamental economic activity. We're a year past the, the bottom in the market. We're a year past uh, the outbreak of the pandemic and the shutdowns and things like that. The world is beginning to, at various speeds, come out of all of this. And there's a couple of things we know about human beings. We know, and I've said this before, that aspiration overcomes fear. We are a society of social human beings that want to get out and do things. There's tremendous pent-up demand. You're probably thinking to yourself, I can't wait until I go on vacation. I can't wait to get out and do this. I can't wait to get out and do that. Well, you're part of 300 million people in this country that all pretty much have the same desires. So we're going to see a huge demand signal from people wanting to get back to doing things that they've been doing that has plenty of liquidity and stimulus behind it. So we see this pattern in the United States and we're going to see similar patterns globally and can begin to take advantage of all of those. I hope that this video has been helpful as we look at things uh, throughout the rest of the year. Uh, I'll be back in another month to do another one. I hope the information has been of value. Feel free to share this with family and friends. You can also visit uh, our website and you can take a look there and subscribe to receive our newsletters, our blog. We send a blog out every day. There's a number of videos and podcasts. So I hope this is informative. I hope this is interesting. I hope it's helpful. And I really want to thank you for your time uh, and your trust uh, and your engagement with us as we continue to work our way through all these things ahead. Thank you very much and I appreciate you joining today's video.